hear people that are pessimists. Harp, harp, harp on this. These people keep repeating it, and they repeat it so much you start to think it's a biblical truth. Lazarus said, I can't, I'm dead. That's not what he did. Lazarus came out. To me, to me, the dead person can't respond to the command of Christ. And then you take lessons from Judas White and Jeff Durkin. It shows in this kind of sequential format. Do you really, really believe, believe that it parallels the method, the method of exegesis that we utilize to demonstrate, to demonstrate those other things? Um, um, no. Well, 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 even even pastors very, very openly smoke, smoke pipes, pipes and, cigars, and cigars just, just as, they as they drink beer, beer and, wine. and wine. Even Jesus, Jesus cannot, cannot override, override your, unbelief. your unbelief. You could like that, like that, hand to hand, you would feel like that, like you were looking good. He wouldn't make any sense. Self righteous, legalistic, legalistic, pure. Realize that this is some kind of little knowledge that God now has to. I deny and glorify the knowledge that I have. Don't beg the question that would demand me to force you to embrace it. Not talking about necessarily choosing something for no reason, but you're choosing that because it's a favorable need. There's a reason to have the choice of that need. And greetings, welcome to Radio Free Geneva on the Dividing Line. This is a road trip edition of the program. I'm still up here in uh, Salt Lake City, uh, where over the weekend, I spoke a number of times, we'll be speaking again this evening, Lord willing, uh, out in Magna on um, a biblical view of sexuality. We talked about transgenderism and uh, the culture of death's insistence upon destroying the good that God has created in making men male and female, the family, uh, marriage, children, grandchildren, those wonderful, wonderful things that God has provided to us, the culture of death hates uh, viscerally and is utilizing uh, the public education system and uh, Hollywood and everything else to seek to destroy all those things that God has given for our flourishing, for our happiness, for our joy, for our fulfillment, for the peace of the society, uh, a, a society that values what God's law says is good is a society that will be a peaceful society, uh, a respectful society, uh, a society where there is uh, uh, rebuke and shame for doing wrong and praise and encouragement for what, doing what is good. Sounds crazy, doesn't it? Yeah, well, <clears throat> that's because most of us have been taught to think that it's crazy, that anything like that could happen. But. Um, but that's the way God's designed things. So that'll be this evening over the weekend. Uh, we spoke on um, the transmission of the text in the New Testament. And uh, Pastor Jason Wallace asked me questions concerning issues related to uh, manuscripts and the transmission of the text and the Textus Receptus and the critical text and all those things that we've addressed over and over and over again on this particular program. And... Uh, 
Lord willing, I'm going to be, I, I spoke last evening at Apology of Utah and uh, a great bunch of folks there. It's the first time I've had the opportunity of coming up. It's a, our church plant here in Salt Lake City, Pastor Wade Rossini, um, Andrew Sokrant, the deacon, doing a great job uh, up here, uh, getting things going. And there were some great folks there and uh, got to see one family that used to be at Apology in Phoenix and is now up had here. The coming up and had our church plant uh, here. Them a long time and uh, their their beautiful daughters and uh, that was exciting. I've spoken to a bunch of folks and yeah, we're gonna get to the RFG stuff here. Hold on a second. Uh, spoke to a bunch of folks so far on this trip, starting in Cedar City and then after each of the things I've, I've spoken, uh, so many former Mormons and uh, many of them former Mormons who uh, directly. Uh, speak of uh, our ministry as having been uh, central to their conversion. Yesterday I spoke to a former Mormon. Uh, we weren't the reason why he left Mormonism, but he ended up in a form of evangelicalism that just sort of left him without direction to know where to go and, and what to do. And someone handed him letters to a Mormon elder. And it was reading that book and the, the amount of theology that uh, is in the book, because unlike most books on Mormonism, mine was intended to communicate a positive message of, well, the fullness of Reformed theology to the Mormon person. And he said he read it a number of times, and that's what gave him the foundation to be able to start witnessing the Mormons and know where to look as far as, uh, uh, as, uh, you know, churches are concerned and, and, and things like that. And, um, so basically, you know, we're, we're coming up on, on 40 years next year, 40 years of Alpha and Omega ministries. And we're just seeing the fruit, you know, I mean, you've got to, you've got to, plant and plant and plant and water. And uh, eventually you start seeing the fruit. And when you start seeing entire families, you know, knowing the impact that that has on children and grandchildren. And it's, um, it, you know, in those first years when you're struggling just to, just to get by and nobody has any earthly idea that, that you exist, um, you can dream that 30, 40 years down the road, you'll see the benefit of all this stuff, but you've got, you've got the promise that, uh, you know, God's word does not return to him void. So it's exciting. And I'm looking forward to seeing uh, more folks as we continue on, uh, with the ministry up here. I don't know what the next couple of days are going to look like. They are talking as much as two feet of snow in the mountains. Uh, the folks who live here say that means it'll be much less down here, but we could still get a substantial amount of snow. And uh, so I'm not sure what the next two days are going to look like. But isn't it? Um, isn't it almost the middle of April? I, I think it's almost the middle of April. Um, yeah. Okay. Well. Uh, seems that winter is trying to hold on, give us one last uh, kick in the teeth before it. Uh, it uh, surrenders. So there you go. Uh, prayers appreciated because I'm I've still got to drive farther north, um, all the way up to Moscow, Idaho. In fact, so um, prayers appreciated for that. By the way, new shirt. Uh, thanks to my wife for sending them up because they arrived, of course, the day I left. <laughs> it always works that way. Daigar Altan Basel Uwine. Now, if you are a regular Bible school or seminary graduate, you're going, that looks weird. Uh, because I used the um, uh, papyrus fonts from uh, Accordance. And so when you, when you, well, it's not really, it's not really the papyrus. No, I have papyrus fonts. I actually used the um, unseal fonts Magiscule fonts from uh, Sinaiticus Vaticanus uh, that Accordance uses for for the 
uh, transcriptions of the manuscripts, basically. But yeah, it's uh, it's a the ancient form. Remembering that New Testament for the first 900 years of its history was transmitted by being written in all capital letters, no space between words, and almost no punctuation. The accordance uses for for the just the way it was, and um, it's just one long but yeah string it, of capital letters, and uh, that's got got to get used to reading when you read the um, the papyri when you read the earlier. Uh, vellum manuscripts like Sinaiticus Vaticanus, um, it can be can be challenging. But anyways, what does it mean? Well, so 1 Corinthians 15, 25, the first four words of 1 Corinthians 15, 25, for he must reign is specifically what it is, uh, until, and then Paul quotes from Psalm 110, 1. And uh, so uh, I appreciate my wife sending up because I wanted to wear these for some of the dividing lines and stuff. And so now I have my First Corinthians fifteen twenty five shirt, and uh, so there you go. That's that's what's there. All right. So plan was not necessarily uh, to uh, be doing a radio free to Geneva, Geneva today, but uh, someone uh, sent me uh, a link to a video that Dr. Frank Turk put out. And I was like, uh, maybe uh, that's that's a possibility. And then I saw it come across my feed directly from Frank, and so I I listened to it, and it's it's a nice short summary of all of the arguments that we've refuted over and over and over and over again without any attempt to uh, improve the expression of the arguments in light of the refutations that have been provided. And it even, I really sort of decided, okay, when Frank recommended or made reference to, but obviously it was in the form of recommendation, um, chosen, chosen but free <laughs> by Norm Geisley. Um, which, you know, uh, I'll, I'll be directly honest with you, has produced more Calvinists than Norm really wanted to admit, uh, even when he was alive. Um, the refutation of that book uh, produced many, many Calvinists. And um, I, like I said, I've, I've known, I know of a number of churches that exist today because of the refutation of Chosen But Free. So I thought, well, let's um, – now, you know, Tim Bushong told us that he was going to give us a new edition uh, of, of, of the, the theme song, but I haven't, I haven't heard anything. Um, so, you know, maybe it's, you know, maybe he's expecting a little more pay for this one, uh, three, four times what we got for the last one. <laughs> uh, I don't know. But um, – uh, we are going to be uh, switching things up, and and uh, maybe some of the old classics will return, and and uh, we'll we'll see we'll see how it uh, how it goes. But um, if you're wondering what Radio Free Geneva is, it's where we deal with uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly in regards to arguments against Reformed theology. And um, it started many many moons ago when I listened to a Adrian Rogers sermon. And I responded to it, and man alive, did people respond to that. Um, they responded to the response, big time, big time. And um, so, been doing it for many, many years now, and uh, we will hopefully be able to continue in the future. Now, before we get started with uh, Dr. Turek, what's interesting is... Uh, we have responded to a number of the things that Frank has said in the past. Um, for example, uh, we did a comparison of Frank's interaction with David Silverman and my interaction with David Silverman, where David Silverman asked the exact same question. And it was very useful, actually, uh, to compare and contrast the uh, 
presuppositional method versus the evidential method in regards to dealing with theodicy, the nature of um, evil and God's existence in the light of, of evil. And, uh, but we've also uh, responded in regards to his um, insistence that belief in the doctrines of Roman Catholicism is not necessarily really all that much of a big deal and um, other related uh, elements like that, as well as the issue of Reformed theology, because he is clearly opposed to Reformed theology. The only time we've ever met, by the way, was at uh, Southern Evangelical Seminary, that one time when um, earth and heaven moved. And um, I was on allowed on campus and, and um, yeah, uh, Michael Brown and I had, had our debate. And um, that was the, the one time we met, uh, he uh, sat in on the debate over uh, apologetic methodology with Dr. Howe. Well, it was, it was not even a debate. It was was not even announced. It was just sort of a, we're just going to do this now and hope you're ready uh, type of situation. Anyway, uh, he was there and seems like a really nice guy. But ever since then, whenever we respond, there's never any response from him. Uh, when uh, recently he did the thing on Roman Catholicism and, you know, said to the person in the audience, yeah, you know, don't worry about it. You know, uh, yeah, your mom may be asking for a priest and stuff like that. But, hey, you know, as long as she just believes in Jesus, she'll be fine. And I, I contacted, oh my, uh, one of those bus size units <laughs> coming around the corner and it is so long. And um, I can, again, 8VUM3. <laughs> okay, there we go. See in the, see in the back, uh, back background there. Yep. That's a Pace Arrow LXE pulling a Jeep behind it. I don't want to get his gas mileage personally. <laughs> Not these days. Um, yeah, that's a big one. Um, anyhow, uh, I would not want to, no, I would not want to maneuver one of those things around. That's too much, too much stress for me. This one's was plenty long enough. I'm 44 feet long when I'm hooked up. That's, that's, that's all I can handle. That guy has got to be 65 when he's got a car following behind him. Um, Anyway, what were we talking about? Yes, Moses was in the bulrushes. And um, uh, anyway, I wrote to uh, Frank and I, you know, uh, I made sure I had the right email address, stuff like that. I said, I'd love, love to have a conversation with you on the dividing line or something like that. About This is very important. People have a lot of questions. Not even, not even the courtesy of a go away. It's just, you don't exist and I'm not going to talk to you. So I don't expect, to be honest with you, um, I've always, uh, I, I believe that Norman Geisler died without ever reading The Potter's Freedom. No question about it. Uh, because I know, I, I knew Norman Geisler well enough uh, to know that he would have considered it a violation of his personal principles to even read The Potter's Freedom. And you may be going, but there was an appendix responding to it. Yeah, a really, really bad one the, the publisher eventually took out because it was so easy to refute, had so many errors in it uh, because it wasn't written by Norman Geiser. It was written by his students. He told somebody else that. Um, so he just, he just had the very firm belief that uh, he could not learn anything from anyone younger than himself. He, he told me that. And so uh, that would not be... Uh, Frank's reasoning here. Um, but I just get the distinct feeling that from his perspective, there are certain people when you talk to them, once the issue of Reformed theology comes up, there's just this look, uh, a, 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 a curtain comes down and it's just like, you just re repeat the same things and don't listen to what's being said. What's ironic is that... Um, his uh, website is crossexamined.org. Now, I give him all the credit in the world. He goes on campuses. 
and he takes questions and hey that's that's tough to do more power to you but on this subject evidently cross examination is not what he wants because if he wants cross examination we know who can provide him cross examination um and as i said on on twitter uh this morning uh i said frank um we stand ready to debate this issue when you're ready to do it and um i last i checked there was no response to that i i've got it up here i suppose i could uh could check here um huh so now i so now i'm i'm looking and now see, this is really distracting because I, I look to see if there's been a response. And the, the weird thing is I sat here for 40 minutes hooked up with Rich before the program started and he's tweaking sound. I mean, just, okay, do this with the sound and okay, I'm going to do, oh, that didn't work. Let's just try 40 minutes. And now I'm sitting here watching all this stuff now that I see on, um, <laughs> and now broadcasting from an inconspicuous fifth wheel somewhere on the fruited plain adorned with a sebts bumper sticker where no one would think to look <laughs> michael potts uh posted that one that's just it's pretty good um i ain't putting an sebts bumper sticker on anything i i might put one on somebody else's <laughs> <laughs> just, I ain't putting it on this. But here's Rich talking about all this stuff about audio output channels. What are you doing, Rich? Come on, man. You had 40 minutes to get all that stuff perfect. And now you're telling me that there was something going on. I don't, I have no earthly idea what's uh what's happening here. Uh but no, I don't do not see any responses to uh, to what I wrote this morning. I, unfortunately, you have to go and actually look at your tweet uh standing ready okay standing ready to do a full debate on the topic dr turek there are 18 responses that i had not seen i why don't i see these things i, I don't know so lauren holiday andy kane uh did, did, I'm, I'm gonna read through all these when it's uh when it's when it's all done uh but i don't see anything from the good doctor himself so yeah and that's sort of everybody else is saying do it do it and um yeah there's a lot of people saying please debate frank was one of the first apologists i discovered he is a smart and intelligent guy but like many christians he attempts to explain away what god says about himself extra prolific said that oh please we need to see this tim dykstra uh humanist mike uh has the eating popcorn gif gif whatever you call it uh teddy rosie belt this needs to happen now that you've thrown down wlc this is the debate i most want to see oh yeah tovia singer too <laughs> you got the time right well uh the potter's clay 1689 well once you put 1689 in your neck as uh that one scholar from westminster would tell us so there's been lots of response but nothing from frank turk because i it, it, as far as i can remember frank has never responded to anything i've ever said so i don't know i don't know all right let's get to it uh talking about it and actually doing it are two different things, isn't it? Uh, it's only three minutes, 51 seconds. And I think there was something toward the end that wasn't overly relevant. So it's less than that, but there were a lot of topics raised. So we could go for a long time, depending on how I wanted to do things here. Uh, so let's uh, share the screen and let's, um, mm -hmm. da -da -da -da. there it is. And voila, and here we go. I'm kind of looking for your definition of what it means to be born again. Um, Jesus said that a man must be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. Mm -hmm. And through my experience with talking to Calvinists, they say you had to first be indwelt with the spirit. 
Mm -hmm. um, before you can even say yes to salvation. Okay. Um, let's let the, the gentleman, it would have been helpful. Um, and I'm not, I'm not going to pop back for short responses. I'm not going to, I'll just let you, you don't need to see me. You've already seen me for 23 minutes, 24 minutes. Um, it would have been helpful if Frank had corrected some of the misapprehensions in the gentleman's questions. He's clearly got some dispensa dispensational confusion. And it's not indwelt by, as in indwelt as a, as all believers are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit, et cetera, et cetera. The issue is what is the relationship between repentance and faith and having a regenerate nature, uh, being raised from spiritual uh, death to spiritual life. Uh, that's the issue. It's not in, in indwelling in that sense at all. And there, there should have been a, a correction uh, offered there, um, which there, there wasn't going to be one. In the Old Testament, for my knowledge, no one was ever indwelt with the Spirit, but we know like Abraham was saved. So uh, what was David saying when he said, take not your Holy Spirit from me? What, what do you mean? Again, I, I'm seeing some, some almost hyper dispensationalism here as part of the confusion. What is your definition then of being born again? Well, the Calvinistic viewpoint is, as you said it, that God has to regenerate you before you can believe. Because Now, notice he, he's saying, as you said, that's not what he said. It needs to be, a, you know, you got to be accurate. Um, he's saying, yes, the Calvinist viewpoint is that regeneration is a divine act of God that then results in faith, repentance, so on and so forth. But that's the same thing as being indwelt. Um, there's there's confusion here. They say we're dead in our trespasses, trespasses and sins. They say we're dead in our trespasses and sins. I thought that was Ephesians chapter two that said we're dead in our trespasses and sins. I thought that was Jesus in John eight saying that we are slaves to sin. Um, that, that, that's, that's what do, you, what do you mean? They say, you don't say that. I don't think the way that the Calvinists interpret that is correct. I interpret the phrase being dead in sin, Ephesians two. So that would mean that we're now going to get an exegetically solid understanding of what's being said in Ephesians chapter two, right? I think when it says we're dead in our trespasses and sins, it means there's nothing we can do to, make up for that, that Jesus is the only way that we're going to ever be reconciled to God. So that's what Ephesians chapter two, I mean, unless there's some other text that is being referenced, Ephesians 2, 1 says, and you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the rule of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience among whom we all also formally conduct ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, doing the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest, but God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. So that seems to very strongly be saying that we were children of wrath and that it was God um, who made us alive together with Christ by his grace and raised him up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. This is all God's activity. Uh, and so this is about salvation. It's not merely a statement that we can't do anything apart from Christ. But once Christ has been provided, then, well, you know, now it's up to us whether we're going to accept it or not. Uh, that's not what Ephesians 2 is talking about at all. However, I think we can accept that offer that Christ gives us in order to be saved. Because So here is your, your assertion of synergism, your assertion of the ability of man in the unregenerate state to do what is good and pleasing in God's sight. This is a an assertion that man can have true saving faith, man can have true saving repentance as, an, as a spiritually dead rebel against God. And then by exercising these things, maybe he doesn't use this terminology, but you, you can't avoid this terminology if you're going to get into any type of meaningful debate. Maybe he's saying that by prevenient grace, uh, you're given this capacity or ability. Um, but 
are all men given this prevenient grace? Because there have been many men to whom the gospel has never been presented. So are, are they given prevenient grace to no end? There are so many questions that, that have to be uh, asked in this situation. Look, if God has to regenerate us before we can believe, and yet God wants all to be saved. Now, at this point, this is the creation of a very surface level, very simplistic and oft refuted uh, alleged contradiction. Uh, if God, ha if God must regenerate us, if God has the ability monergistically to bring about regeneration and God has a universal salvific will and does not have a specific decretal will, then we have a contradiction and therefore we can dismiss Calvinism. So let me, um, let, let's, let's, let's talk about this for a second because I think it's important. <clears throat> when Reformed people, based upon biblical uh, context, biblical text, and a belief in believing everything the Bible says, make the assertion that there is a decree of God that fixes the number of the elect, that the elect are personally known to God, that is not simply a matter of a, a, a generic class that can be uh, filled by the free will actions of men, but that God actually has an elect people, which the chapter before the one sort of citation so far of Ephesians 2.1 is Ephesians chapter one, <laughs> which specifically says that God did not choose Christ. God did not choose an impersonal group that God chose us in Christ. And it is for salvation because adoption is a part of salvation. Forgiveness of sin is a part of salvation. You can't cut those things out. So the class election stuff does not work, not exegetically. Um, the privilege thing doesn't work. Well, it's sort of like Romans 9. No, it's not. Th these are all things that have to do with salvation, uh, with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 1.14 who is the Arabon, the down payment of our redemption. Uh, but that all flows from the decree of the Father, the accomplishment of the Son. It's a Trinitarian gospel, and it is reformed. Um, and so uh, that material is being presented to us in Scripture. Does it create a contradiction? Reformed people will immediately go, well, you need to recognize the multiple uses of the term will of God in the Bible. No, no, no. Now you're just trying to, no, you, everybody has to. If, if you're going to hold a Bible in your hand and say, I believe all of this, then you can't ignore major portions of it. And it is simply an obvious given that there is such a thing as the prescriptive will of God. What do I mean? The Bible says um, that it is God's will that all men repent, right? That is God, it's revelation of scripture, that all men everywhere should repent. And God's law says, you shall not murder, you shall not kill. You shall not sell someone to slavery. So this is God's prescriptive will. But plainly, the Bible then speaks of God's decretive will. Why? Well, because Acts chapter 4 tells us that the murder of Jesus was the will of God. Now, that violates his prescriptive will, but it's his decretive will. He decreed that it happened. It was the most glorious, greatest thing that's happened in time. And yet it was the most evil thing mankind ever did. That's true. Um, you should not sell someone into slavery. And yet, Genesis 50, 20 says, it was God's will that Joseph was sold into slavery. 
His brothers were accountable for that. His brothers sinned when they did that. But the reality is that was God's decree. Now, if you're going to believe sola scriptura and tota scriptura, then you have to put these things together. You have to believe both of them. And it's possible to do so. You're not just simply saying, oh, that's contradictory. No, it's not contradictory. Not if you recognize that those two discussions are are addressing different aspects of how God deals with his people in time. That he gives us the pres- his, his prescriptive will. This is how we know his character, know what our character should be. At the same time, how we can then have confidence and faith that God is accomplishing what he wants to accomplish with his decree in light of the fall of man and the redemption of man and the the demonstration of the glory of God and the character of God that only comes about through that gospel, that redemptive plan, which is more about God than it is about us. That's where most people miss all this stuff when they think that it's more about man than it is about God. So when Dr. Turek says, well, the Calvinist says that, that God must regenerate man. Yes, because the Bible says so. Because the Bible says we can't do what is pleasing to God. We cannot submit ourselves to the law of God. That we are slaves to sin. And Jesus said the son has to set you free. So the Bible teaches what we're saying. But Dr. Turek's tradition denies that, so he doesn't believe that part of the Bible. Oh, he says he thinks he does, but what he's doing is he's creating a lens to make it disappear. So it just isn't a problem anymore. And then he says, God wants to save everybody. What does he mean by that? Does he mean that there is the the general command that goes out to all men to repent and believe? That's not the same thing as the will of God expressed in Ephesians chapter 1 toward a specific people. Is it? No. He's using it differently. He's speaking of a universal salvific will. And I'm sure he would go to one of the big three. I've never heard him respond to my chapter on the big three in response to his mentor, Norman Geisler. I've never heard him reply to that. Um, and that may be why I never hear from him and why he doesn't want to be cross-examined about the big three. But man, that would be useful. Don't you think it'd be useful? Uh, I, I, think, I think everybody in this audience realizes that a meaningful, not a dodged uh, cross-examination period, especially on those texts, would be vitally important. I would be happy to defend the exegesis I've offered in Matthew 23, 37, or or uh, uh, First Timothy 2, uh, Peter's discussion of, of the elect uh, and the patience of God, any of them. Uh, be happy to do that kind of a kind of a thing, but see the creation here of a false conundrum by ignoring the fact that you know if if Dr. Turek was going to be accurate in his representation of us, what he would do is he would say, well, Calvinists distinguish between the prescriptive will of God and the decretal will of God. And uh, they believe that while God commands all men everywhere to repent, that God is under no obligation to grant the ability to do that in light of the fact that we are appropriately related to Adam in his fall. I would be interested in knowing where Dr. Turret goes with original sin and the imputation of the guilt of Adam's sin, um, because that generally requires too much reformedum, <laughs> too much reformedness uh, to really, really affirm that. And what's interesting is, I've heard, I've heard Frank uh, slip into he'll borrow some of our 
argumentation. He recognizes, for example, that presuppositional reasoning in regards to worldviews is extremely useful and that there is an absurdity in the way of thinking of the rebel sinner because you're living in God's world. And so he'll borrow from some of our stuff, not realizing that to borrow that requires the theological foundations that built that, which include this recognition of the um, prescriptive will of God, the, the decretal will of God, the differences between those things, and the fact that the text that he's utilizing to create a universal salvific will, um, I don't believe he could defend that interpretation. He certainly could not demonstrate that the interpretation that I would offer is impossible. And I know that I can present numerous texts, John chapter six, Ephesians chapter one, John chapter 17, um, Romans chapter nine, uh, where his interpretation will, would not survive uh, cross-examination because they're inconsistent. Uh, so, so there you go. Uh, but just, just so you recognize how this works uh, in creating these, these conundrums, um, I think it's, it's helpful uh, to see that. All right, back to this one, and here we go. Isn't everyone saved then? Mm -hmm. He does want us all to be saved, yet only he regenerates some. That appears to be a contradiction to me. Well, uh, and again, that's, I'm sorry, that's extremely simplistic, especially in light of the depth of conversation that has been had since, even since the time of the Reformation, but had been had before then. You can go back to God's child. You can go back to Augustine. The, these, are, these are things to say, well, that seems contradictory to me, is really, um, I think, very shallow. It also appears to be a contradiction to say that we can have love without free will. If we don't have free will, what's the, how can we love? We're not okay, so uh, the just just a very very common assertion, and it's it's meant to uh, connect to certain types of people, but it requires ignorance of Scripture because what is the greatest commandment? The greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Jesus, Jesus repeated that. I'm, I have to play with the microphone over here just for the sound stuff. Um, Jesus repeated that, taught that, demonstrated that. The same Jesus who said, you are children of the devil and you're slaves to sin. He who commits sin is a slave to sin. The son has to set you free. Jesus didn't think that was a contradiction. You're commanded to love, but you're a slave of sin, which means you do not have, quote unquote, autonomous or free will. You are a slave of sin. Can we, admit, can we agree, hopefully, that if you are a slave, you are not free? Um, I, I, don't, I don't know how people fit that stuff together in their minds, but they're, 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 they'll stand up there and say, yeah, we're slaves to sin, and yeah, we're free. And to truly love, you have to be utterly free. And, and, and the idea is, what's being said is, so what's being created in the, the mind of the person listening to this is, well, those people are actually saying God forces you to love or God um, creates some kind of feeling or something. This is, this is one of the problems in thinking of, of, of having an unbiblical definition of love. Earth mover. <laughs> they, they, it was perfectly quiet all morning. <laughs> and now we've got earth movers uh, running around. They're actually working on a, it, it, this is a pretty nice little park here in, it's KOA in, in Salt Lake City. Um, it's a pretty nice little park. And they're, they're working on stuff, but I'm seeing earth movers running all over the place. They may be trying to get stuff done before the snow hits, <laughs> before a snowpocalypse hits uh, in, uh, in the middle of April. <clears throat> anyway, so uh, this issue of what love is, love is something that God can command of us. And so once again, you have to have, you know, there's a lot of conversation going on about Thomas Aquinas and stuff like that right now. 
and believe you me, uh, Dr. Turek, Dr. Geis are deeply influenced by Aquinas. Um, this is one of the key areas of concern that everyone, everyone should be concerned about, about this rising Thomism amongst the Reformed, is that um, Aquinas, brilliant as he was, did not have a biblical anthropology. I cannot imagine anyone in the Reformed world that would say Thomas Aquinas had a biblical anthropology. And yet we are the ones that recognize the centrality of a biblical anthropology to a solid understanding of biblical soteriology. If, if you begin with a Greek philosophical understanding of mankind, if you think that mankind has a, a natural light that can lead him to a true knowledge of God in the fallen state. Now, there's always a distinction. This could come up in a moment. You always have to make a distinction between a discussion of man now and the theoretical discussion of Adam. Because we can have theoretical discussions about Adam, but what you've always got to remember is at most we have two chapters of scripture that even touch on briefly in, in just snippets, Adam in an unfallen state. And you might be able to argue a text over here or a text over there, something along those lines, but we simply have no description and there, that means there are just all sorts of questions that scripture never intended to answer in regards to Adam if he had not fallen, Adam if he was in this situation or that situation. You, you, can, you can run yourself ragged going theoretical about those things. The irony is that, that people will write entire books about stuff like that, but when it comes to fallen man, we've got a lot of so look at I, just think about jeremiah <laughs> just just one prophet and the insight that he has into the depraved fallen heart of man and all that just gets ignored you know jesus jesus says more about our slavery to sin in john 8 than almost anything we have in the bible about any theoretical knowledge of adam in a pre-fallen state but we don't want to talk about that. Well, we have to, if we're going to believe sola scriptura and toto scriptura. We, that's what we got to do. Um, so I think that's um, important, important stuff to be looking at. And I don't know why it does this. There we go. And back to the video. Moist robots, as the atheists say. Uh, so I have some issues with the hard five-point Calvinism view. I also think, tragically, it makes God the author of evil. You say, why does it make God the author of evil? Well, I'll give you a little story that went back to Dallas Theological Seminary a number of years ago. My co-author, Dr. Norman Geister, who actually wrote a book called Chosen But Free. Which has been refuted thoroughly and has created more Calvinists than probably uh, any other book written recently. And in fact, I, I spoke with someone within the past couple of days that, uh, well, well, yesterday I spoke with a brother who uh, was given, after he came out of Mormonism, he was given chosen but free. And then he read the Potter's Freedom and that was it. He, from that point on, recognized the necessity, the biblical necessity of, of reform theology and had no interest in going that direction anymore uh, at all. Later, after this debate, was debating a Calvinist by the name of John Gerstner. And during the debate, Geiser asked Gerstner, does man have free will? And Gerstner said, yes, man has free will to do what he desires, but God gives him the desires of his heart. So Geiser asked, well, who gave Adam the desire to sin? And Gerstner said, mystery. And Geisler said, contradiction. There is really one of the, um, to be honest with you, that does not reflect well on Norman Geisler um, at all. 
And in fact, Norm's interaction with Reformed theology as a whole does not reflect well on Dr. Geisler. And I, of course, I can give you, I can give you more stories along these lines than most people can because of the Potter's freedom and Dr. Geisler's astonishing response to that book. Just astonishing. I've I've told people, but I, I don't think I've ever on the dividing line gone through um, everything that really happened after the Potter's Freedom was published, uh, the appendix that Dr. Geisler added to his second edition of his book that was then removed later on because it was so bad, um, so many errors. Um, yeah, we really haven't gotten into all that. But, uh, you know, I've, I've never heard this debate between Gerstner and Geisler. Uh, it would be interesting to, to hear. But, uh, this illustrates exactly what I was just saying. Because when we talk about the will of man now in the fallen state, we have pages and pages and chapters and chapters and books and books of divine revelation on that subject. We have almost nothing on Adam and the unfallen state. What does it take? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll say it straight. It takes an incredible amount of hubris philosophical hubris to dismiss the mystery response with the, by, by saying it's contradiction. You do not have sufficient basis in scripture of knowledge of Adam's uh, constitution in regards to the nature of his will in comparison to all the information we have about the fallen man's will in scripture to make that kind of, a, of an argument. What Dr. Gerstner, I think, should have pointed out was exactly that, that the fundamental assertion that's being made that is erroneous is that there is a parallel that we can draw. We do not have sufficient information to draw that parallel and to challenge him to prove it scripturally. <laughs> he can't. There's nothing about it. And then he'd have to say mystery <laughs> as to why there's not. Um, so thinking presuppositionally, identifying those presuppositional things, but that is not a foundation logically for the assertion beforehand, which we've, it's very common in the William Lane Craig influenced group, um, to assert that this makes God the author of evil. And it doesn't matter what you say to these folks, they will not hear what you're saying. They, do we not have literally decades of evidence of this now you can you can point out to them well wait a minute dr turk do you believe god knows the future i don't i don't know exactly where he stands i don't think he's an open theist probably a molinist of some some sort i suppose so is he gonna go down that line and have to now defend you know counterfactuals and some true subjunctives and all the rest of this, the mind numbing soul stealing stuff of, uh, of Molinism. Is that what he's uh, going to, going to try to defend? Um, he has to deal with the reality that God had knowledge of what was going to ha happen with Adam. And the Molinist response is an empty response. It, it has no meaning to it. It's, it, it. it is a failed theodicy. We were trying to get into that in the debate of a couple months ago um, in the cross-examination, but that only got so far. Uh, but it's a failed theodicy. It's a, it's a shallow, unsatisfying theodicy uh, because it, it has to bring in this external concept um, that fundamentally you are, you are left with more unanswered questions than you have answered questions. Um, but again, one of the two of us can camp on text after text after text and demonstrate that our interpretation of those texts is flowing from the text. And the best the other side can do is say, well, we've got this system and that means this text means this and that text means that and that text means that all determined by our system, 
rather than our system being derived from the text. That will always be, for me, you know, when I when I talk to committed people that are you know committed to this system or that system, and I encounter folks that are like, no, 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 I, I I've heard all you have to say, and I just don't. And I'm just like, okay, that's fine, because I've seen so many times others who fully understand that you have to derive your beliefs from the text of scripture. You have to pull it directly from the text of scripture and there's a difference and they can see what that difference is. Um, and when I was younger, when you talk to folks that you couldn't convince of that, that would be frustrating. It's not really frustrating for me anymore. Uh, partly because it's not up to me to do that. I don't have the capacity to do that. And secondly, because I've seen people who once were like that, and then over time, the hound of heaven got them, and they're like, yeah, yeah, I was just being pigheaded <laughs> uh, type of a situation. So there you go. Uh, but we're actually, we might, might I, I realize the hour is almost done, but um, we, we might actually get through this. That would be a first. Now you're making God the author of evil. See, that seems to be a problem in my view anyway, making God the author of evil. God is not Allah. He's not arbitrary. He's good. Um, God is not Allah is another Geislerism that again is just horrifically shallow and um, extremely um, prejudicial, false, it's untrue. Uh, it shows not only an ignorance of Islam, but certainly of what Reformed people are saying about God. Um, God is not Allah. Uh, that does not mean, however, that uh, God is less than Allah. So I understand what Qatar is in Islamic theology, probably better than Norman Geisler did. Um, and probably better than Dr. Turek does. And I've debated Muslims in foreign countries on that subject, interestingly enough. Um, God is, is not arbitrary. That's exactly right. That has nothing to do with Reformed theology. And if you think it does, it just demonstrates you're utterly ignorant of Reformed theology. And I'm, I'm sorry to see people demonstrating their ignorance of Reformed theology. But if you think God is arbitrary, you say, well, but he, he chooses... He chooses whom he wills, and it's not based upon what we do. Right. That's not the same thing as being arbitrary. Well, what's the difference? One is the exercise of God's freedom to grant unmerited grace, literally demerited grace, to convicted rebels based upon what will glorify him versus the arbitrariness that is demonstrated, for example, um, and I would, I would ask Dr. Turek, how many Hadith could you narrate that would illustrate the Islamic understanding of Qatar um, off the top of your head without looking anything up right now? As, again, he's not going to watch this, so I, I don't know why I'm bothering. But how many could you? Because the arbitrariness of a law as illustrated in Mutawatir Hadith. Do you know what Mutawatir Hadith is, Frank, without looking up? Um, is very, very clear and, and very, very uh, establishable. Two brief summaries of two different Hadith. You have the clear statement in Sahih al-Bukhari where Muhammad says that there are those who do the deeds of the people of fire right up until the time appointed for them. And then the decree of Allah overtakes them and they enter into paradise. And there are those who do the deeds of the people of paradise right up until the decree overtakes them and they enter into the fire. The idea being there are people who live godly lives and yet will end up in hell because they're not chosen by God. And there are people who live horrible lives who will end up in heaven because they're not chosen by God. That's arbitrary because it has nothing to do with the life they live and the purpose of God in demonstrating his holiness within those individuals and in the redemption through the mediator, Jesus Christ. The 
more obvious one was the man who killed 99 people. And the summary of this one, it's a longer story. The summary of this one is there's a man who murdered a hundred people. He, he asked, he asked a, a scholar if God would accept his repentance. The scholar said, no. So he killed a scholar. So it was a hundred people. He had killed 99. Then he killed a hundred. He was going to a town to find out about repentance when the time of his death comes because God writes the day of your death on your forehead. Um, and he dies, and Allah says if he's one cubit closer to the town he was going to than the one he was coming from, he will go to paradise. And then in some stories, he makes the ground shrink between where he died and the town he was going to, and so he went to paradise. So here's a mass murderer who never repented, who goes to paradise. The arbitrariness, because there were, there were uh, companions of Muhammad that cried on their deathbeds because they had no confidence they were going to go to paradise because there's no way to know. There's no mediator. Allah is arbitrary. And if you think there's anything to do in any way, shape or form with what the Bible teaches concerning the elect, their union with Christ um, and the demonstration of the glory of God in the salvation of totally undeserving people, then I don't even know how to talk to you because there is no connection between the two. So every time you hear someone, and they're normally just repeating what they've heard from Kanner and Geisler and people like that, they do not know either Reformed theology or Islam and do not have a high enough standard of truthfulness to make sure that they would know the truth about either one. So I call upon Dr. Turek and others, stop. You are only demonstrating that you do not know what you are talking about in both areas. Stop. For your own good, learn. Just repent. Do better next time, as some of my say. All right. Okay. Back to it here. He allows evil. He may bring judgment on us. But he is not the author of evil. He gives everybody the ability to respond to him, but only some of us do. He gives everyone the ability to respond to him, but only some of us do. Standard synergistic uh, approach. But what does that mean? Um, there are still unreached people groups. There are still groups in this world that do not have the scriptures in their language. How have they been given the ability to quote unquote respond to him? How was the Amorite high priest, my favorite example, uh, how was the Amorite high priest hundreds of years before Christ given the same ability that I was given as a child to respond to the Christian message? I was raised in a Christian family. Sunday school and church was all I knew uh, from, from my earliest memories. You're, you're telling me that the Amorite high priest was given the same prevenient grace? Is that what he would use here, the term prevenient grace that I was given? That's ridiculous. That's absolutely ridiculous. It's just not true. And the Bible nowhere says it. Where does the Bible say this? Because that's clearly an exceptionally important assertion on his part. So where does the Bible say this? Where, where in Ephesians 2, you know, but God being rich in mercy gave the same kind of saving grace to everybody? No, that's not what he did. That's not what Ephesians teaches. That's not what John teaches. That's not what Romans teaches. That is not a biblical teaching. And anybody that looks at the Old Testament sits there and goes, uh, wait a minute, you're saying that God gives the same light to everybody at all times. Is that what you're saying? Uh, like Pharaoh's soldiers drown in the Red Sea, maybe? Uh, the firstborn of Egypt. Um, you know, because the events in Goshen were far removed from other cities in Egypt. They didn't know what was going on. They knew that there was a bunch of weird stuff happening and the Nile turned to blood and that stunk and there were frogs and everything. Well, it was bad, but they didn't know who Moses was. 
And then one night they all drop dead. The firstborn. Huh. They give them the same chance. It's so absurd. You know, maybe you just repeat it so often that, that, that you start believing it. But when you ask, does this really represent what's found in scripture? You just have to go, uh, no, uh, that doesn't make any sense at all. No, it doesn't. Doesn't make any sense at all. Share screen. Because we resist the Holy Spirit. We don't want there to be a God. We want to be God of our own lives. So I think we have free will that we can respond to God's call to the Holy Spirit, going out to all the world, convicting the world of sin. But some of us don't want to be convicted. We want to go our own way. There is truth in what was just said, but it also assumes uh, that the same call goes to every person. Many are called, few are chosen. And plainly in scripture, there is an efficient call. That's what the golden chain's about. Those whom he predestined, these he also called. Those whom he called, these he also justified. Is anyone justified apart from faith? No. Therefore, the calling results in having faith. It's right there in scripture. But these synergistic human traditions sap the scriptures of their consistency and their power of proclamation. And that's what we've been demonstrating on Radio Free Geneva for many years and thankful for the opportunities of having done so. Uh, once again, I would uh, very much say, um, Dr. Turek, uh, you go on campuses, you take on atheists, why not me? Uh, I've debated some of the same people you've debated. People can go watch these things. Like I said, from what I saw uh, on uh, Twitter briefly just a few moments ago, well, not a few moments ago, but uh, half an hour ago, there were lots and lots of people who were saying, yeah, yeah, that, that, this really needs to happen. It would be so useful. Join with me in edifying the saints. Wow, we're up to 40... <laughs> up to 46 comments now uh, on that that particular wrong one um, that we've got. Oh, goodness. Um, Reverend Theo Babel God mockery. Calvinists are wrong and Tulip is an evil doctrine, but Frank, turns out you are wrong too. La, 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 la. Um, it's going to be interesting to read through all of this stuff. And uh, here, you want my prediction? I haven't, you know, been able to read through it just sitting here. Here's my prediction. The farther you get into the comments, the less they will have to do with what was originally said. Isn't that how it works? That's how it works on Facebook. That's how it works on Twitter. That's how it worked on all the web boards I was ever part of years and years ago. That's what it worked on the AOL forums back before there was social media, uh, when it was an early form of social media, all the rest, that kind of stuff. Uh, that's just that's just how it works. And there's no there's no way around it. Uh, and I, I'm sure I'm sure by the time I get down to the bottom, there'll be discussion about transgenderism and something about pulled pork and probably something about sports. <laughs> it's just it's just how it works. Anyways, all right, kids. Um, you know, if if you would, if you would pray that the that the Lord would um, um, ameliorate the strength of the storm, shall we say? I really, I, I really would like to have uh, the opportunities on uh, on Tuesday and Wednesday to uh, do the stuff we were supposed to be doing, meeting with the people we're supposed to be meeting with. Um, I mean, I'm not gonna. I can survive. I've got plenty of food and water and stuff uh, here in my my little mobile home. Um, but uh, you know, and and I personally am sort of. Uh, <laughs> Rich says the snow falls on the just and the unjust alike. <laughs> That's true. That's true. There's no two ways about it. But uh, anyway. Uh, this shouldn't have any impact on my getting up to Idaho for the debate 
uh, in less than two weeks now uh, with Doug Wilson and the other stuff we're recording and speaking and stuff like that. Um, it, it, it shouldn't, Lord willing, uh, affect any of that. So we will we will press on. So thanks for watching Radio Free Geneva today. Uh, I, I Again, I don't know what the schedule is going to be the rest of the week because my schedule is now going to be up in the air due to weather. But if I am stuck in here, hey, we might as well do a, do more dividing lines, right? There's lots of stuff to be uh, discussing and, and uh, talking about as it is. And who knows, maybe next time there will be a wintry wonderland uh, outside the window instead of the, the, the green grass across the way, it, it might all be white. Um, I might just disappear into it. If I, if I close up my white jacket and with my white beard, I might just be a floating head. <laughs> it's everything white all behind me or something like that. So, um, hey, look, I'm from Arizona. I don't see snow all that much, but I got all I needed when I was in Conway. So I really don't really need any extra, but if it happens, it happens. Lord's in control. Lord's good. Thanks for listening to the program today. We'll see you next time. God bless. You'll constantly hear people that are Calvinists harp on this. God sovereign, God sovereign, God sovereign, sovereign, sovereign. They just keep repeating it. And they repeat it so much, you start to think it's a biblical truth. outside the tomb of Lazarus, she says, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus said, I can't, I'm dead. <laughs> That's not what he did. Lazarus came out. She so mean to tell me a dead person can respond to the command of Christ. And then you take lessons from Judas White and Jeff Durpin. It shows in this kind of sequential format and <laughs> Do you really believe that it parallels the method of exegesis that we utilize to demonstrate those other things? Um, no. Some new Calvinists, even pastors, very openly smoke pipes and cigars just as they drink beer and wine. Even Jesus cannot override your unbelief. You quote a verse like that to him, you know what it would sound like if you were listening to it? He wouldn't make, wouldn't make any sense to him. A self-righteous, legalistic, deceived jerk. We need to realize that he's gone from predeterminism. Now he's speaking of some kind of middle knowledge that God now has to. I deny and categorically deny middle knowledge. Don't uh, beg the question that would demand me to force you to e embrace it. You're not always talking about necessarily God choosing something for no apparent reason, but you're choosing that meat because it's a favorable meat. There's a reason to have the choice of that meat. And now, from our underground bunker deep beneath the faculty cafeteria at New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, safe from all those moderate Calvinists, Dave Hunt fans, and those who have read and reread George Bryson's book, we are Radio Free Geneva, broadcasting the truth about God's freedom to save for His own eternal glory.